Welcome, everyone. Um, I'm Jim Menno. I'm the executive director of the Cure JM Foundation. I, I recognize um, many names on uh, on the list tonight, but I see we also have many newcomers. So, um, so please save up your questions because we will have a, a, a what I hope will be a robust uh, question and answer uh, session um, uh, towards the end of, of of tonight's presentation on second opinions. Um, I. Um, I particularly want to thank our, uh, our, our presenters, uh, Dr. Lisa Ryder, who is uh, also a member of CureJM's Medical Advisory Board, uh, and Dr. Jeff DeBergsten, who is the co-director um, of uh, our Center of Excellence at Duke University uh, in, in North Carolina. Uh, I have the pleasure of doing official introductions and, and uh, would like to welcome Dr. Lisa Ryder, who's a pediatric rheumatologist and the head of uh, Environmental Autoimmunity Group at the National Institute of Environmental Health Sciences. Um, she's at the National Institutes of Health in Bethesda, Maryland. Uh, she's I mentioned already that Dr. Ryder is a, uh, met, is a member of our Medical Advisory Board. She's actually the chair of the Medical Advisory Board. Uh, and she also sees patients uh, and does research in juvenile myositis uh, at both NIH as well as <clears throat> at the George Washington University CureJM uh, Center of Excellence. Uh, she uh, has led many international development uh, efforts, especially important ones on uh, validated outcome measures uh, and trial response criteria. Uh, she's defined major autoantibody phenotypes and associated outcomes. She studied genetic and environmental disease risk factors um, and led clinical trials uh, in new therapies. Uh, just really one uh, of our most extraordinary clinicians um, and researchers around the country. Uh, Dr. DeBergsten, who will be speaking second tonight, is a pediatric rheumatologist uh, at Duke University um, in Durham, North Carolina. Um, he's the co-director of the Duke Cure JM Center of Excellence in Juvenile Inflammatory Myopathies, and he's a principal investigator um, of the work that is done um, at that Center of Excellence. Um, he also oversees the Duke Myositis Biorepository. Uh, Dr. DeBergsten has um, um, provided many um, second opinions, um, as has Dr. Ryder, uh, to CureJM families um, ac across the country, um, which is why we've asked them to uh, both present uh, to you um, on the topic of, of why should I consider getting um, a second opinion. Uh, we are, I wanted to mention that we are recording this session um, tonight. Uh, and if you all could please um, mute yourselves during the presentations and then take yourself off mute when we get to the Q&A would be much appreciated. Uh, with that, I will turn it over to uh, Dr. Ryder. Uh, Lisa, please. Well, thank you so much, Jim. And it's a great pleasure for me to be with you all tonight. And uh, thank you for attending. Uh, we're gonna do a little bit of presenting, but wanted to leave a lot of time for your questions. Can you see my slides? Just wanna be sure. Can you see my yes, slides? Yes, okay? we sure can. Okay, yes. great, good. So um, as you all know, juvenile myositis is a heterogeneous systemic autoimmune disease collection. It's a collection of conditions that are all have the hallmark of chronic muscle inflammation, and many patients have unique autoantibodies. And dermatomyositis or juvenile dermatomyositis, the form with the characteristic skin rashes shown here is the most common form in children. These are very rare conditions, an annual incidence of one to five cases per million in children. They have onset during childhood throughout the childhood years, a mean age of onset of seven and a half years, but 25% of the children are under age four and there's a female predominance at all ages. It's important when your child is diagnosed that we're really sure about the diagnosis. And there are many mimicking conditions that we really have to carefully distinguish to be sure about that diagnosis. Most especially when your child doesn't have these characteristic rashes, then there are a number of muscle diseases to particularly uh, be sure about. But there are even when your child has the rashes, other autoimmune diseases, autoinflammatory diseases, skin diseases, even infections to distinguish. 
And then it's important to start appropriate treatment as quickly as possible because this improves outcomes of the conditions. There's less calcinosis, there's less chronic disease course, improved muscle function, and less long-term sequelae if we have the most appropriate treatments going right from the beginning. So here's just a picture just showing you, and we've come to understand now over the past 20 years, really that these are a collection of conditions defined by different autoantibodies, and they really have each a different picture of the illness. Uh, and that now that we understand that, doctors who are more in the know or more knowledgeable really do understand that these different types of disease that can occur and really can help understand more about what that means for your child in terms of their illness manifestations and responses to treatment and outcomes. In terms of treatment, we're lucky in that uh, not only through a European treatment trial, but also consensus among North American pediatric rheumatologists that there's now much more standardized approaches to the first line treatment of these diseases with high doses of prednisone and methotrexate given right from the beginning, often with pulse steroid and or IVIG, and that other agents can be used as adjunct. Plaquenil, physical therapy, photoprotective measures, topical treatments, calcium and vitamin D. But when, when we get beyond those initial treatments, there really are a host of choices now, and we're lucky about that to choose from. N none of these treatments are FDA approved for the treatment of myositis. And exactly which one to use next, really, it's a little bit more subtle and not quite so clear. Uh, and that's where more expertise can be helpful. There is also no known therapy for treating calcinosis, although we're starting to realize that some treatments may be helpful in this condition as well, this complication. So I have most experience with the GW Myositis Center and NIH, as Jim mentioned. Uh, and I just wanted to tell you about why parents come to see us at these centers for a second opinion the top reasons that they come. One is that patients receive in-depth expert evaluation and input from a whole team. And this is the GW team with Dr. Hannah Kim, Dr. Rodolfo Curiel, who's the head of the center, Dr. Gulnara Mamarova, who's the scientist at the center, and Michelle Best, who's the parent and administrator of the center. Um, so people are looking for more information we do a very in-depth medical record review and review the lab testing, biopsy slides, MRI, and other imaging. And we have latest information on testing, treatments, more in-depth expertise on JM patients. Dr. Kim and I, and Dr. Curiel has seen a number of patients. Dr. Kim and I are exclusively focused on juvenile myositis in our work, in our research and clinical care of patients. We're able to, for some patients, confirm the diagnosis, and that's especially important for these forms without the characteristic skin rashes. And we can also provide consultation on treatment if your child is not responding to standard treatments or needs to access newer therapies or get new approaches. Sometimes we provide an outside set of eyes to review and give a deeper perspective, of, take a look and back at everything that's gone on and just give a new perspective. We look for patterns in the lack of response to treatment or failing to get off medication. Sometimes uh, doctors and patients need help on tapering or discontinue medication. Is the child really ready for that taper? What is the best timing? What is the best strategy? Also, if your child is having flare-ups, trying to identify the reasons for the flare and how to appropriately treat that. And then there are certain illness complications that we can assess in more depth and provide specific therapy, and that might include persistent skin disease, also in consultation with the dermatologist that we work with, calcinosis, lipodystrophy, the loss of body fat, and lung disease, and other complications as well. So other reasons families come to visit are that we do offer this consultation with other specialties. At GW, we also have a lot of expertise in transitional care. Uh, Dr. Patience White, 
uh, we work with, who is a, a world expert in transitional care, and Dr. Kirill is an adult rheumatologist. So we're able to see a number of patients on to uh, adult rheumatology care uh, in partnership with us as pediatric rheumatologists. We also consult with dermatology, rehab medicine, and other specialties. And then we have a cross-fertilization between different centers, GW, NIH, and Dr. Olche Jones at Walter Reed National Military Center across the street from NIH. So um, we're able to offer shuttling back and forth between these centers and exchange of research information between these centers. And then some families really do enjoy participating in the research. At the NIH, that's actually a requirement of coming to see us. And this is the NIH Clinical Center here and uh, our team at the NIH, including Dr. Adam Schiffenbauer, Rita Volachayev, our nurse practitioner, Anna Jansen, our research nurse. This is Fred Miller, who was formerly chief of our group and now is emeritus. Um, so we, people enjoy helping with the science and learn, helping others with JM as they're participating in the research. They realize that they're helping to move forward our understanding of juvenile myositis, helping to develop new treatments, helping to develop new ways of assessing disease and detecting disease, even in the future, preventing disease. And they, through the research, learn more about their disease and potentially could receive new treatments um, through some of the treatment studies we've had, both at GW and NIH. So what would be some of the advantages to your child's care at home following this second opinion? Well, first, we at GW and at the NIH work very closely with your child's doctors to help them give your child the best treatment possible. Uh, we discuss things with them between visits. So we might see your child and get to know your child, and then maybe we haven't seen them back or not back for a while, but we might still be able to talk with your child's doctor at home and advice in between. It's also an opportunity for your child's doctor to learn more. Uh, and this gives just, in, again, recent in-depth knowledge, additional expertise that provides more information to the home provider as well. Treatments could be recommended or additional information provided that helps support your child's provider in gaining insurance coverage. Remember, we don't have very many FDA approved treatments for juvenile myositis. So this also uh, getting another opinion from experts and we issue a detailed report to you and your child's provider could get, be the extra information that the insurance company needs to be able to issue that treatment. And most providers are very excellent, but they also are very willing to have you obtain that second opinion. So how is a visit arranged at GW or NIH? First and foremost, you should discuss it with your child's doctor and be sure that you're both on the same page about going for a visit and plan goals together for that visit. Then you would contact GW or NIH. GW, contact Michelle Bess, and our requirements are that your child be at least seven years of age. At NIH, Dr. Hannah Kim is in the Arthritis Institute, NIAMS, and I'm in the Institute of Environmental Health Science. To come to NIH, you must qualify for and participate in a study. So we don't see patients for a clinic at the NIH. There is no charge for these visits at either center. Uh, for the main appointments at GW, there's no charge, but if you had a consultation appointment with another clinic or another specialist, then you would need to have a payment through your insurance company. At the NIH, there is no charge for any of the appointments or testing that we do, including blood testing and MRIs and other specialties. You do send all your medical records ahead and biopsy slides to review, imaging studies. We take hours to review these materials. You arrange travel and there are charity programs available for patients to be able to travel. Uh, at the NIH, we have the NIH Children's Inn, a family-friendly environment where people can stay. Uh, at GW, some patients stay at Ronald McDonald House or a local hotel. Um, what might your visit look like when you actually come? Well, typically, we read all these records before you arrive. At GW, a fellow will meet with you first 
for more than an hour to go over everything, the history, the physical, then present to the attendings. Uh, teaching is very central to the mission, especially at GW. Then we review these things and come and see your child and take a closer look at some things. We then discuss things uh, and develop assessment and treatment recommendations. Um, and then we, you might be participating in research or see a consultant. You might also meet with our parent volunteers, such as Michelle Best, who might provide additional educational materials or shared experiences. And then after your visit, we would be calling your child's doctor. So at GW, it's, it can be more than three hours for a visit. Uh, returning patients might be an hour to two hours. Um, at NIH, we have some additional steps. It's actually, our visits are typically one to five days, so they can be even longer. Uh, we go through NIH admissions. Uh, you meet with the research team. We actually start by uh, going over and signing informed consent for the study, uh, and then discuss the visit plan. Then you go through many of the same testing that you would do at GW, some in more detail like muscle strength testing or MRI or additional blood testing. Uh, we review everything with you and then complete any follow-ups. So in summary then, uh, GW and NIH are national and even international referral centers that provide comprehensive multidisciplinary consultation on clinical management of juvenile myositis. Uh, we perform research at these centers in collaboration among each other and also with other myositis centers. And we also are educating medical professionals and trainees on juvenile myositis. At GW, we've had a particular focus on educating adult and pediatric rheumatology fellows, residents, medical, and other students, even visiting faculty from around the world. But we're working together and with you for better outcomes for all juvenile myositis patients. And thank you for your attention. And we'll uh, move on to Jeff's presentation and then take questions after. Great, Dr. Ryder, thank you so much. And, and Jeff, um, over to you. Okay, it looks like everyone can see my slides. Yes. Yes. All right. Well, thank you, Jim, for your initial introduction and Dr. Ryder for giving the background about uh, juvenile myositis as well as um, the value of um, a specialized center. And I uh, thank everyone who is attending uh, this uh, town hall tonight. Um, so my name is Jeff DeVergson. I am an associate professor of pediatrics for the Division of Pediatric Rheumatology at Duke University. And uh, I'd like to continue the discussion about uh, seeking a second opinion for uh, children with juvenile myositis. All right, now if I can get my, there we go. So when we think about a second opinion, um, this sometimes can be a loaded phrase and this can depend on the situation in which uh, this topic is uh, you know, brought up. So if it's recommended by a treating physician, it can be a little less um, daunting because it seems a little more acceptable when it's brought up by a physician. Um, because then it's, you know, the physician that might be suggesting it to the family that uh, it may be helpful for the care of the patient and it, it takes some of the um, uh, you know, doubt out of the, out of asking. Um, but when it's requested by the parent, there tends to be more of a negative connotation to that uh, phrase, second opinion, and it can be a little more uncomfortable. Um, 
you know, the way that we should really look at a second opinion is that it's more of a necessary process where by both the uh, care provider as well as the family is um, doing a surveillance of, you know, how um, the care relationship is going, how the, um, you know, treatment of the uh, child individual is going um, and making sure that uh, everybody's comfortable um, as we're treating and uh, coping with, you know, a rare uh, chronic disease. So again, this is a collaborative effort. This isn't meant to be contentious. Um, and this is a relationship and, uh, you know, the goal is to deliver the best care for um, the individual. Um, and there are many factors that are inherent, inherent to uh, juvenile myositis that encourage um, second opinions. And one include, you know, that it's first and foremost, it's a rare disease. and um, so, you know, it, not every physician that has seen dermatomyositis or polymyositis um, that will be seeing uh, the initial presentation that will know the diagnosis. So it can be a difficult diagnosis to make. And even when you get to the point where you're seeing a uh, uh, pediatric rheumatologist or a rheumatologist, um, that rheumatologist may not have as much expertise as someone who sees um, myositis on a more regular basis. And we'll get more into that. And again, in um, an individual patient or individual patients, um, there can be difference in presentation and over time in um, response to treatment because there is significant uh, uh, heterogeneity in the disease. And Dr. Ryder was uh, pointing out the different um, uh, myositis antibodies and how that can affect the different presentations and um, courses. Um, there's also consensus regarding some initial therapies, but as Dr. Ryder also pointed out, treatment can become more unclear um, as uh, we get into uh, uh, courses where um, patients might not be responding to our initial therapies um, when we're using medications that aren't FDA approved and um, there might be um, various choices. Um, again, the initial provider may not specialize in the treatment of juvenile myositis. Um, many pediatric rheumatologists are located at academic centers and uh, families, you know, are not necessarily um, close to those academic centers. And uh, it's approximately 25% of children with rheumatologic disease, now this isn't just juvenile myositis, but rheumatologic disease as a whole, live greater than 80 miles from a pediatric rheumatologist. Um, and uh, juvenile myositis can have complications from the disease that may require a specialist who has more um, experience with that complication, as well as complications from treatment. Um, and so there are many things that, you know, you as parents and even your children will be dealing with or can be dealing with that um, may make, um, you know, initial course of this disease as well as um, further into treatment um, 
sometimes daunting and confusing and where you may need extra help and where you should not feel um, uh, you know, uh, you know, bad or, um, you know, that you're in the wrong for acting, asking for a second opinion. Um, you should be, um, you know, feel like you are in a good place based on, you know, your relationship to be able to do that. And you can consider asking at, you know, any point in, um, uh, you know, the course of uh, your child's uh, disease. So, you know, this can be um, any time. This can be a diagnosis. Um, this can be during the treatment of active disease. This can occur during remission, including when off medications, you may have additional questions that could be answered by um, someone in a more specialized center. Um, so I earlier alluded to there being some barriers that may be there from, you know, receiving care even from a pediatric rheumatologist. Um, and that includes um, geography, you know, uh, so approximately 40% of children with rheumatic disease are living greater than 40 miles from a pediatric rheumatology clinic. And as I mentioned, 20, what, 24%, 25% greater than 80 miles from a pediatric rheumatology clinic. Um, and then in addition to that, um, I'd like to just highlight, you know, the number of um, active uh, pediatric rheumatologists. So we all know that there are not many pediatric rheumatologists in North America, in the U.S. included. Um, and in addition, dermatomyositis or juvenile myositis being a rare disease, um, even those pediatric rheumatologists that are trained in fellowship, you know, may see a certain number over the course of their fellowships go into practice, you know, may see, uh, you know, three or so patients a year. Um, they are not seeing, you know, the number that a specialized center may see. And uh, so there are reasons just based on experience that your pediatric rheumatologist may be um, wanting to seek additional help or information from a specialized center. So that gets us to this question about what about evaluations that uh, you know, a myositis center. So um, this is a study where they looked at um, many uh, papers that were presented that had been written about um, management of juvenile dermatomyositis to come up with consensus recommendations for various things, including um, disease um, diagnosis, management, um, and uh, some of their recommendations included that um, children with suspected inflammatory myopathy should be referred to a specialized center, um, especially those with um, high risk um, disease, and they define that as um, certain uh, meeting certain criteria. 
Um, and this was based largely on uh, um, expert opinion, but these were the uh, recommendations that, um, you know, were uh, proposed for um, patients with high risk. Now, in uh, speaking about our center at Duke, um, we are also a multidisciplinary clinic, um, and we take that approach to um, diagnosis and care of patients with uh, juvenile myositis. Um, we've been recognized as the uh, Cure JM Center of Excellence since 2019. Um, we care for children with juvenile myositis from diagnosis and to young adulthood, and we have an active transition program to adult care. We also serve as a consultative center to support families and providers requesting a second set of eyes, second opinion. And we educate medical students, residents, and fellows through our clinic. Um, we perform basic translational and clinical research and we are active with collaborations locally, nationally, and with some international researchers. And this is uh, our uh, group, um, including our physical therapists, our neuromuscular neurologist, um, our clinic nurse, We also are, have um, two labs that we work with actively. Um, one uh, currently is a biomedical engineering lab and then a metabolomics lab. And then we are uh, very well associated with our neuromuscular pathologists. I wanted to point out our fellow here, Dr. Covert, who is currently working with Dr. George Trusky on developing a human uh, uh, model of juvenile myositis. And you know, through this, we are supporting the next generation of bench to bedside research. Um, Dr. Covert has done very well with this. Uh, we also have our biorepository. Currently, we have over 60 individual patients in our biorepository with over 3,000 samples. Um, we have published two studies to date using samples from that repository. Um, and those samples are currently um, being used in a study where we're collaborating with um, researchers at the University of Michigan and UCSF. And this is just a cartoon looking at systems biology. And we are also working on clinical drug trials. Um, we are uh, working on a specific um, uh, medication called the Moralone. Uh, and with our colleagues at the Duke Clinical Research Institute to develop a clinical trial for this medication with the trial led by uh, one of my colleagues and uh, the co-head um, uh, of the Myositis Center of Excellence, Dr. Ardalan. And we are also using uh, our model of uh, myositis uh, to test that uh, uh, pharmaceutical. And uh, Dr. Ardalan has also been working with Dr. Kim at the NIH on uh, patient reported outcomes of her study uh, treatment with baricitinib. And we're also working on uh, mental health and cardiovascular health studies. So thank you for your time. And now we'd like to get on to questions.
Actually, I forgot to present one slide also. I apologize if I could go back and present one more. Okay, let's yep. see. There Sorry. we go. Okay. Which was just, um, I wanted to make mention about um, the Cure JM Centers for Excellence uh, as uh, one potential place for second opinions with you heard about GW Center and the Duke Center that Dr. Verkson described. And there's also in Chicago at uh, Lurie Children's Hospital, Seattle Children's and San Francisco uh, Children's have centers. Um, then there's the Clinical Care Network uh, from CureJM, which is a network of 25 pediatric and adult rheumatologists in 15 US states, Canada and the UK who have been referred by peers and colleagues and also have CureJM family support available at their center. So that's another potential source of, of expertise. And then you could also go to the different academies or colleges, American College of Rheumatology, American Academy of Dermatology, American Academy of Neurology, and search for ped other pediatric rheumatologists, dermatologists, or neurologists in your region of the country. So uh, I think there's a lot of potential uh, people to seek out for expertise. Right. Thank you, Dr. Ryder. And, and I appreciate that slide. I was going to mention something um, uh, along those lines myself about the, uh, <clears throat> the, uh, the three other CureJM centers of excellence in San Francisco, Seattle, and, and, and Chicago. So we do have you know, I think most, you know, in, in the large sense, you know, many geographic areas of the of, of the country covered. Um, and also, thank you for mentioning the uh, the, the the clinical care network. Um, I, I I would like to say that um, if you have any questions um, about uh, about second opinions, um, uh, where to go, um, or 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 want any kind of uh, suggestions um, or, or advice. You know, we have staff here at CureJM who would be uh, have have been working in the JM area for uh, for many many years. Who who'd be you know happy to talk with you about that um, because they're in in addition to um, you know extraordinary cl clinicians like Dr. Ryder and Dr. DeBergston, uh, there are others as well who are in areas of the country where where you might. Uh, you you might reside if you were to find that a, a you know a Duke or a GW were just was was sort of just logistically a little challenging um, for you. I would say that you know if, if I may, Dr. Ryder and Dr. Bergsten, that uh, that you know many of these clinicians yourself and have worked with them over over the years, and oftentimes work in a consulting capacity with um, with with other. Um, very, very experienced and qualified JM clinicians um, around the country. So if you have any questions at all, please don't, don't hesitate to, uh, to, to contact us um, here at, uh, at CureJM and we'll do everything we can to, to uh, get you on the right track. Um, and you can always do that by just contacting uh, me directly. Uh, that's uh, james.mino at curejm.org. Um, you can find it on the website. Um, and um, we'll be happy to, to, to help you move on in, those, in that direction. With that, let me, uh, let me open it up to questions any of you might have. Uh, feel free to um, uh, put your questions um, in the, either the chat box um, or, uh, or just take yourself off mute and, and speak up. Most of you I see um, um, don't have your, your, your video cameras on. So if you'd like to do that, please do as well, but just take yourself off mute and speak up if you have any questions. If we're already being seen at a center for excellence, would you still recommend a second opinion with the mentioned sites presented today? So, um, if you are um, satisfied with your um, answers and your experience at the other center, um, there you know would not necessarily need to be a reason to um, see 
either of us at you know our centers if there is something that you know you heard from Dr. Ryder or myself about our centers or had questions about our centers we definitely be willing to uh, and if there's any um, research opportunity that exists at either of our centers that you'd be interested in, we'd also be willing to um, discuss that. Um, I don't know, Lisa, if you would have more to say about that. I, I mean, I think that the centers are quite expert, uh, you know, um, so you're getting very expert care, but we have on rare occasions seen patients from other centers. Uh, uh, they've come mainly to the NIH to participate in some of the research studies. And, you know, some of them patients have had some unusual aspects to their disease or um, uh, where they and the center doctors thought it would be helpful to have them come. Uh, so I, th I think it's a case by case situation, but I think I will emphasize you're getting very expert care at the centers. We have a, a question in the chat from, uh, from uh, Jessica Kovacs um, and I'll just review it here very, uh, very quickly. Hi, Jessica. And uh, uh, well, Jessica, you're on. So why don't you just go ahead and, and stay. Hi, Jim, how are you? Hi, Dr. Ryder. We miss you. <laughs> <laughs> So we were scheduled to come to the GW Center in July, but I know with the family emergencies, the center was closed. Um, and then we were told it would probably be closed through September. And we did hear that maybe one patient was offered an August appointment. So we just wanted to see if you guys are open again. And if so, will we be able to see you or will we be seeing you through virtual um, accommodations? Right. So I think GW is open um, and there are some family emergencies. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so, um, uh, my personal schedule has become very busy. Uh, uh, I, I have taken over as the head of our group at NIH in the past year. I'm writing a new clinical trial. I'm involved with our calcinosis clinical trial. I'm on the, I, I spent almost every day last year, including weekends on the ward at NIH. Um, and this year I'm equally busy uh, on the ward. So my ability to see patients at GW is pretty much participating virtually, but Dr. Okay. Kim and Dr. Curiel are there okay. you know, full time. And, and uh, I am hearing about all the patients and involved with all of them. So. Okay. So if we contacted Michelle, you think that then there's availability now um, they're up and running. I'm sure they're up and running. There could be a backlog. I mean, I think that, you know, they, they have to prioritize who, you know, who can come when, you know, but I'm sure that they're back open. Okay, good to know. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, hi, we have a question posted from uh, Renessa uh, on, online as well. Um, hi, we're from Trinidad. My four-year-old daughter was diagnosed with JDM three weeks ago. However, here in Trinidad, we do not have a pediatric rheumatologist. Thoughts on next steps for uh, Renessa? I believe that's what you're asking. Hi, everyone. Hi, Renessa. Hi. Um, so here in Trinidad, we do not have a pediatric rheumatologist, neither. Um, we maybe have like one to three adult rheumatologists who have never seen her, a pediatric pediatrician actually um, made the diagnose. I don't know if he was correct, um, but her symptoms uh, pretty well is, is um, JDM. Um, it, it's tough, it's been a tough journey so far, you know, because we are so limited to resources when it comes to this, this whole journey. Um, I don't know what is my next step, what step to take. I, honestly, I don't know. Um, so I'm lost. <laughs> um, yes, uh, I mean, we could, um, you know, sp speak a little bit more offline if you would like about um, 
opportunities um, to try to, uh, you know, um, help with, you know, your situation. I don't, are, what are you looking for? Um, more help with assessment or help with treatment or of course of course i'm looking for anything open to, to you know to, to get in our better of course but yeah. um here well basically she had a fever started in june it started with a fever and then it started with the the, the flare like the rashes on her cheeks over her eyes on her knuckles mm -hmm. elbows um and then we, you know, we took it to a few doctors who said it was hand, foot, and mouth disease. Like they didn't know, and one pedi pediatrician here actually assumed was oh, well. He said, you know, well, this definitely look autoimmune. And um, we were um, admitted to the hospital here. Um, however, as I said, we don't have a pediatric rheumatologist, so they did their their blood work. Her ESR level was seventy three. Her CK level was 263. Then they did um, blood work for the myositis panel, ENA 23. Um, one thing that they was waiting to confirm that was an MRI, which did show that her ties are inflamed. And you know, but and gradually she 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 got weak. She can't climb up steps. She can't raise up from lying down. You know, things like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So has she started treatment now? Um her doctor, um, well, you guys are all the way over there, so you all might not know about him. He's the head of pediatrics here at the hospital here. Um he started her on prednisone orally, um, six mLs morning, six mLs evening, and yes, um Friday was her third shot of methotrexate. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So I think um, probably, I don't know for um, Dr. Ryder, I think the main issue would be for both of us, or at least for me, um, would be how much information and how much um, guidance we could give your physician without actually seeing your daughter. Um, or seeing her records, and I think that's what we would have to decide. Um, you know, the ability to do that before we could um, give more of an opinion to your current physician, and that's what we'd probably have to discuss with you. Um, the logistics of that, of course, okay. I mean, it's been overwhelming. I've been, I mean, you know, it's been stressful. It's been, it's been an emotional roller coaster because it's like, you know, we don't know. Here in Trinidad, she's maybe like one out of five kids that have this condition, possibly being the youngest child in our country. Mm -hmm. yeah. People don't know about it. When you tell them, you know, they ask, well, you know, what's wrong with her? And they say, well, you know, she's autoimmune and they don't know. They don't know. Honestly, they don't know what yeah. you mean by that. And I'm definitely willing to, um, you know, speak with you, like I said, um, to get your um, email or your number to, to do this. Of course, I'll be so grateful and thankful, you know, because we are willing. We are willing to do what it takes and to go the extra mile just to get her better. She was a perfect four-year-old little girl, you know. And, um, mm -hmm. You know, and we could see what resource might be closer to you also but yeah okay uh renessa if you could put your um email in the uh in the chat um you know jeff can follow up with you then um uh, next week okay i'll do that thank, okay. thank you thank, thank you thank you very much thank you so uh, much another question that that came across i think i understand part of this um is um i know there um, are models being created of patients with JDM? Can you elaborate on what this exactly is or means? Um, not, not sure who that question is from. Okay. Well, uh, the goal of a model primarily is that um, 
you know, given the um, rare nature of juvenile myositis, um, it's difficult to get um, you know patient uh, muscle um, patient samples uh, to use to um, investigate the um, pathogenic mechanisms of the disease and um, even to be able to uh, do certain trials for medications. And so if we can come up with a good model that mimics um, the disease process, we can use that model to um, test, um, hopefully, you know, once it's um, been built to a certain um, standard to test uh, various um, medications um, to see what their effects on that model may be uh, before we bring them to um, certain trials. And so, you know, we start that off by building a, a simple model and then um, testing that model and then um, making that model a little more complex and in continuing to test the performance of that model based on what we, our knowledge of the current pathogenesis of dermatomyositis or juvenile myositis is. And, um, and validate it as we go, as we build that model. And that's what we're doing to this point by um, using um, human muscle um, in a specific uh, 3D structure, basically. Uh, hey, uh, question um, for, for either Dr. Wright or Dr. DeVerston um, from uh, Megan McGregor in Australia, um, timing on weaning prednisone. We're starting to wean prednisone four milligrams uh, for the second time in three years. We've had some very aggressive treatment and using tofacitinib as well. Blood's holding steady and strength increasing, but are, but are there other factors to consider with the wean if weakness presents? We're located in Australia with Dr. Chattow. Prednisone weaning is, is complicated. Um, you know, um, some patients uh, don't tolerate the wean way down low, uh, and we just have to take it more slowly over a longer period of time. Uh, also, we just have to be sure that the things that are triggering, if, if things flare up again, what is that? Like, maybe it's sun exposure or something like that, then we need to be controlling that to facilitate that the disease will stay quiet. Um, so, uh, it, it, and it varies with different subgroups of patients too, you know, this picture of different types of patients. So there are some types of patients that don't tolerate weaning weight down way low and really can't realistically get all the way off prednisone or not, not really soon, you know, some can okay. do it, some can do it more quickly. Um, thank you. I think just it was mentioned that, that you had sort of learnings and models there. And obviously we, we can't do what we've done if it flares again. So like everybody else, just very keen if there's more learning. I know that Dr. Chaitao does consult in with you. Um, not necessarily on us, but with other patients. But uh, it's very hard when we're international because there is no research going on in Australia. And um, yeah, we just, we're looking and hoping, but we're just 
purely hoping that we can get off the prednisone. Um, and it's only these lectures that really give us access to further information. Yeah, thank you. Sure. I think we have uh, time for one more question. Um, I have a quick question. Um, my daughter was diagnosed when she was two years old and we did go down to uh, Chicago for a second opinion and we saw Dr. Pacman. That was 13 years ago. So she has been, you know, we've had our ups and downs, but um, I feel we're kind of in a rut. She's strong right now. She looks good. Um, I was just wondering, do your research centers, um, would, she, would, would they take uh, her to get a second opinion, not on a diagnosis, but really on um, treatment? We're trying to get her off the medications, but her doctors don't think so, but we think so. So we're kind of stuck. So would you be willing to see her? And the second part of the question is, what's the wait period? So at um, GW, that, that's a common type of patient that we see uh, who's looking for guidance about getting off treatment um, or trying to reduce treatment or do treatment a different way. Um, it's always best that you and your doctors agree that, you know, it's good to get that outside help because in the end, you know, we're going to see your child once and we're gonna issue a very detailed report and we'd wanna communicate the information to your child's doctor so they can execute some of the recommendations, you know? So we, we wanna work with them um, for the better outcome of your child. So, um, so that's where I think being on the same page that, you know, it's good to get that outside input. Um, the wait time I can't answer, uh, uh, you know, the, it varies. Uh, and some of that is really about how quickly you get your records in. You know, some of the wait is just about we're waiting to get people's records. They've asked to come see us, but the records haven't arrived. So we can't schedule the visit till the records get in. Um, all right. And when you say records, it just means like they're all their blood work, they're the, all the history. I mean, right. So all or, the or, visits they've had with your uh -huh. pediatric rheumatologist at home. And then if you've been to Chicago, those are usually very useful reports also to have a copy. Okay. All right. Thank you very much. Sure. Well, I want to thank you uh, all for uh, being with us tonight. And particularly, I want to thank Dr. DeVergston and Dr. Ryder for their excellent presentations and for their commitment to uh, Cure JM and most importantly to uh, uh, JM families um, around the country and around the world, really, who come to their respective centers. So, so thank you very much for that, that, uh, those excellent presentations. Um, if you um, do have any questions that um, you know come to you later tonight or in the next couple of days, um, feel free to send them to me. Uh, again, james.mino, M-I-N-O-W, at curejm.org. I'll, I'll send them on to Dr. Ryder or Dr. DeVergston, who I'm sure would be happy to answer any of those questions as they, uh, they might come in in the next several days. So I appreciate your being with us um, and hope you'll join us for uh, our next town hall, which uh, which will be be, be coming up, uh, I think next month, and uh, we'll look forward to seeing you also, uh, um, hopefully at CureJM's uh, annual family conference, which takes place um, next year to, in uh, 2023. This will be our first conference in three years uh, as a result of of COVID in the Washington D.C. area. Will be taking place. Uh, uh, between uh, June 29th and July 1st, uh, 2023. Um, information is uh, on our website uh, and uh, you'll be obviously hearing from us um, uh, as the weeks and months go by and we get into 2023 as well. So for, for those of you who, um, who would like to meet with more of our clinicians and presenters um, at our really extraordinary uh, family conference, um, I look forward to seeing you there. 
again, thanks for being with us uh, this evening. And uh, again, if you have any questions uh, in addition, please feel free to uh, send them in to us. Thank you all.